again, I'm Ryan Fortson. I have the, uh, the honor and the challenge of introducing our keynote, lunchtime keynote speaker, who probably needs as little, if not less, introduction than Fran Elmer did this morning. Um, Willie Hensley is, uh, has a long and distinguished career of advocating for Alaska Native rights. Uh, just some of the highlights of his career, he helped found the Alaska Village Elect Electric Cooperative. Uh, he was a state legislator for 10 years. He was a founding member of the Alaska Federation of Natives, a director of the Nana Regional Corporation for 20 years. Um, his recent uh, occupation is as a visiting distinguished professor of business and public policy here at UAA, where he has a class on Alaska's policy frontiers. Um, and since I can't really add anything to his biography, we do have biographies of all of the speakers in our uh, presentation materials. Uh, I thought I'd rely on trying to uh, tell an anecdote. And so uh, last week, uh, Mr. Hensley came to my office and we want, he wanted to talk about the topics that uh, we'd be interested in having him discuss today. And we had a very good discussion. At one point he started looking around my office and my office is admittedly a little bit messy. Now he, he was nice, he didn't point that out. Uh, the only thing he did point out was that his autobiography was on my bookcase. Uh, which I highly recommend, 50 Miles from Tomorrow, available at fine bookstores, assuming they still existed. Um, I got my copy actually at Walgreens. Which is, it's true, I really did. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I assigned this book, I teach Alaska Native Law, Tribal Courts and Alaska Native Rights. Uh, and I assigned this book to my class because, I, you know, when you, you talk about these topics that we're discussing today, you tend to think of them in the abstract, and really there's, there's a heart behind the reason why we're interested in these issues and why we're advocating uh, our various positions. And one of the excellent things I think about uh, this book, which I really do sincerely highly recommend, is that it goes into, starting to get a little bit of an echo, it really does go into uh, discussing his background, his upbringing, so that you understand why uh, development of the Arctic is such an important issue for Alaska Natives. And one of the things that we talked about last week in, in, in our meeting was how, it, and, and this is discussed in the book as well, where he got some of his inspiration was 1966 when he was in Fairbanks at the University of Alaska Fairbanks taking a class uh, from Justice, the great Justice J. Rabinowitz. And it got me to thinking that, and, and he, from that he wrote a paper called What Rights to Land Have a La Alaska Natives, a uh, very influential paper that uh, played a central role in uh, the negotiations that led to the eventual passage of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. Uh, and it, it got me th to thinking that one of the great things about being an educator is you never know where inspiration is going to come from, inspiration uh, among your students. And Professor Hensley um, got his inspiration for taking a class. Hopefully there'll be people who get their inspiration from the presentations we're hearing today. Uh, and hopefully we can be inspired by Mr. Hensley's achievements over the course of his life. So with that, I turn the floor over to Willie Hensley. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Now, is this, uh, can you hear me okay? I, I can turn it up. Okay. Koyan, Koyagipsi Apai. Kovesik Tunga, Katirugut Uvlupakmani, University of Alaska, me. Kuvunga Egaruk. Kikitarumingrunga, 
in your group donga, Katurimi, as in no tampangani, Kemik Pagmi, as in Kekitarumi. I thought I would use that our language uh, because I'm fortunate to have retained some of it in spite of all the pressures uh, against it. Um, and I'm still a learner, even at my age, um, when it comes to our, our language and culture. It's a fascinating language. Uh, what I said was, uh, thank you, thank you very much. I'm happy that we are meeting here today at the University of Alaska. I'm Rarook. <clears throat> By the way, that name is, uh, um, our term for a mountain is Irrik. If you're from the Yupik country, they say Ingrik. And anything with an R-U-K on the end, Irrarrik means smaller, like a small mountain. No, not a big one, just a little one. Uh, and uh, if there's a P-U-K on the end, it's usually bigger, like Kokpuk, big river. It's a corruption. Kobuk is a corruption of Kokpuk, right? And uh, when uh, uh, Evans talked about uh, the communities in our region that uh, he works with, where are you, Evans? Oh, there you are. <clears throat> of course, he, he's a smart man, and I'm surprised that by now he doesn't speak in Yupeq after all those years. <laughs> However, uh, the pronunciation of uh, a lot of our uh, our uh, names, of course, have been sort of westernized, like he talked about Shungnak. Well, this here, this little green uh, semi-precious stone is Isinyak, it's jade. And Shungnak is a kind of a corruption of the word Isinyak, which is, we have a mountain of jade up there, you know, uh, upriver. It was important uh, historically because we in traditional times, we didn't have metal, and uh, jade was a very, very hard material that they, they worked into uh, various items that they could use. <coughs> um, Norvik <coughs> is actually uh, not Norvik, it's Nutvik. Nut means to move, and a V-I-K on the end means a place. So a missionary moved his share of the people, his flock, from Deering, which was near a mining town, to get away from all that sin and stuff, and moved it to the bend in the river called Nutvik. Of course, we call it Norvik. Okay. Anyway, um, I'm using up all my time, unfortunately, on riffraffs. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to thank Ryan for the invitation and thank Duke uh, for putting on this event and the university also for supporting it. And uh, I'm uh, just uh, happy to be asked to communicate with you since you know many of you come from out of state and maybe not know very much about Alaska. Uh, I was born in 1941, exactly 200 years after uh, uh, Bering uh, stumbled on Alaska down near Seattle. I like to say that because he didn't, he failed in this first attempt to show that Asia and North America were not connected, right? And then in, eight, in seven, uh, 1741, he, he did, finally. Uh, in, in any case, um, uh, all he should have done was just ask our people up there, you know, whether or not they were joined. We could have told him, uh, you know, they weren't. And uh, uh, by, by that time, you know, we had long ago traversed all the way from the Bering Straits all across the Arctic to Hudson's Bay. Uh, to parts of Quebec and Labrador, Labrador, and of course to Greenland. And I like to say that if we had another 100 years or so, we could have founded Europe. Um, but uh, my hometown is named for uh, Otto von Kotzebue, uh, <clears throat> who was a German uh, working uh, for the Tsar. And he came to uh, what we call Kotzebue now uh, in 1815 on a worldwide trip uh, on a vessel called the Rurik. And um, uh, the reality is that uh, from at least our indigenous perspective, like so many parts of the earth, <clears throat> the vast spaces that our people occupied and control have been colonized and taken from us. And we, live in, we have lived in, intimately with the land and the waters for at least 10 millennia. 
And in the case of Alaska, uh, to use a legal term, the land has been taken. You know, in, in the old days, uh, when the, in historical times, uh, when the United States wanted to pay Indians for lands illegally taken, uh, the Indians, they had to get a permission from the Court of Claims to file a lawsuit as a tribe. Uh, and then they had to go and prove their area of use and occupancy and the time and of the taking when it was illegally taken, whether it was taken by a corporation for mining or for a railroad or in some other illegal way. So, so that uh, term is a legal term. Um, and once there was a determination of an illegal taking, then they would take the anthropologist uh, area of use, use and occupancy, multiply it by the value at the time of the taking, and they'd get a number. And then you'd have to go to Congress and get compensation. Uh, when I realized that the Clinkets, uh, after using that approach, uh, uh, they only got seven, just over $7 million after 35 years in court and not one square inch of land. In any case, to me, that was unethical, criminal, illegal. <laughs> At least that old system in my mind didn't work. I'm getting ahead of myself. But in any case, in any case uh, when Shelikov came, I think it was in 17, late 1700s, 1780s, maybe 1784, 87, when he showed up, he, he was a, a, a merchant and a hunter of furs uh, from Russia. I think he was from Rilsk. But when he showed up in uh, Kodiak, he talked about uh, battling with the people of Kiktuk. And um, Kiktuk is a, is a word, uh, in fact, my hometown. Uh, Kiktuk means island. Kiktuk, uh, Kiktaruk is the traditional name for Kotzebue. Uh, probably was a little uh, barrier island that got connected to the, uh, to the um, Baldwin Peninsula. Uh, but if you say that word kiktuk, all up and down the coast, the west coast of Alaska, all the way north, all the way to Barrow, uh, all the way to Hudson's Bay, parts of Labrador and Quebec, if you say kiktuk, they'll understand what you're talking about because you're essentially talking about a single culture that spans all of that time and space. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, like so many peoples around the world, our traditional homelands have now been divided up among arbitrary political borders in the Russia, United States, Canada, and Greenland, which is a part of Denmark. Uh, nations, they love expansion, more territory for resources, such as fur and minerals, more people to tax to sustain the nation. And when Bering's ravaged crew rebuilt their broken vessel on an island at the end of the Aleutians on their way back home, they found the island teeming with foxes, fur seals, and sea otters. So this sort of incidental catch of fur on an exploration expedition really was what caught the attention of the fur hunters in Russia that had in just over half a century found their way from the Ural Mountains all the way to the coast, just to the doorstep of Alaska. So in, uh, in human terms, uh, the Russians who ventured out into Siberia in those days, their future probably didn't hold much for them if they were a serf, or if they can even get away. Uh, uh, you could either live a downtrodden life in the settled parts of Russia, or you could take a chance and go out into the hinterlands, either get killed or freeze to death, or you might get rich. And in, in reality, uh, those uh, 900 sea otters that they brought back to mainland to the mainland precipitated this fur rush and the, the value of just just the sea otter alone at 80 to 100 rubles per skin 
in the Chinese market was perhaps around $70,000 or more, or 70,000 rubles, at a time when an ordinary Russian worked for two, two rubles a month, or three. And so you could see uh, what drove people you know, into Alaska, okay? Uh, however, in just over, in just over a half century, the 8,000-year-old Aleutian or Anungan civilization out in the Aleutians was virtually destroyed by uncontrolled fur hunters. Uh, eventually, the Russian-American company Monopoly uh, was created, and uh, that whole uh, initial uh, period from 17 to early 1740s on was a complete and total disaster. People died of disease, enslavement, and starvation. The population was reduced by 80 to 90 percent from around 15 to 17,000 down to about 1,500. So that's a story that most Alaskans don't know about. <clears throat> and, and I didn't know that much about it either. Until I've had time to think about it and read about it. The Sukpiak people in the Kodiak area and the Gulf fared uh, uh, very little better. Um, but however, when you think about Alaska, uh, from a commercial standpoint anyway, it's uh, since the days of the Russians, it hadn't changed much in several key ways. And uh, that is, it's, it is a high cost area, especially for energy. Um, it's still thinly populated, relatively speaking. It's far from the marketplace of the world and is not exactly a breadbasket. That hasn't changed. I mean, the Russians were going all the way to California to try to get grain and other foods, and maybe even to Chile. And the implications are, uh, to be a successful venture in Alaska, a resource venture, uh, whatever you're after has to be either massive in size, rich in quality, near the water, or in extreme demand. If the venture is to help support the population through taxation for all the key human needs like schools and the police and uh, regulation and health care, what do you tax? to get what you need for the people, you know, could make the venture somewhat uncertain, right? Because of the thin margins, because of all these other factors. Um, in the past, resource developments uh, in Alaska uh, didn't leave much here. Uh, little was done to provide services to its population. A huge stands of timber, a massive fish runs, the rich copper and gold deposits, the whales and the sea otters, virtually all the profits left the territory in those times. Only oil has left a significant boon to Alaskans in terms of employment, services, programs, infrastructure, and dividends. We have had a 35-year celebration of providing for the hopes and dreams we had when I was first elected to the legislature in 1966 as a young 20-something, just seven years after statehood. It looked for a while as if statehood was unaffordable in those early days because of the small population, very little industry, uh, high cost, okay? Now, uh, the world is completely enamored of the Arctic. In the past few years, I've attended Arctic conferences in Oxford, in France, in Washington, D.C., in Seattle. And al almost uh, in every instance, I find that my job, in part, is to remind people of the indigenous history before we get lost in all the complicated issues, uh, such as the law of the seas, marine resources, oil and gas, military considerations, future infra infrastructure needs, international boundaries, and all that sort of thing. And almost in every instance, just like today, there's hardly an indigenous person here <laughs> that lives in the Arctic. 
anyway, in any case, we should be here. Uh, the reality is that, uh, not surprisingly, is that people who live in the Arctic and who've made it their home may not be as excited about the renewed interest in the, their homeland because what has happened in the past, okay? So, so I hope you won't turn me off here, but you know, I think people need to understand the past, okay? Um, we all understood what happened in the Aleutians and in the Gulf area. But when it got to the Clinkets, you know, the Clinkets were pretty smart and they were pretty strong because they had been trading in guns with all the, whoever came up there to trade, the Spanish, the English, the French, the Americans, you know, so even, even at the time that Russia signed the deal, when the doors shut at the fort at night, they were inside and the Indians were out there because they didn't have control. In any case, uh, there were less than, had I had known history in the, in the mid 60s when we were getting ready to do this 11th hour battle for our land, <clears throat> had I known there were less than 800 Russians in Alaska at any one time, there's no way they could have had sovereignty over Alaska in any way, shape, or form, except in a few small places where they had the guns. You know? In any case, uh, we never gave the land away, we never sold it, you know, and, and they never penetrated most of Alaska. Also, uh, but we began, to, we began to lose control, of course, of our space, because between 1867 and 1924, we had no rights. We were not citizens of the United States. There was no way we could protect ourselves legally. <clears throat> For instance, uh, uh, the Organic Act of 1884 was a vehicle to get mining claims to white people. Native people could not get mining claims. I immigrants had more rights than we did at that time. Okay? And then the canned salmon industry began to build canning facilities in every major river in Alaska where there were salmon that people depended on from Ketchikan to Kotzebue. We even had, they even had one in Kotzebue, for God's sake, uh, at the turn of the century. So we couldn't protect, you know, our, the, the very food that our people depended on were being taken. In fact, it became private property with the fish traps. When they corralled those fish, it was their property. We couldn't get them. Okay? Um, and the whaling industry. There were approximately 35,000 estimated bowhead whales in the Bering Sea when they first discovered them. Before the century was over, 90% were gone. A key source of the protein for our people. And when they couldn't, every venture out was a business venture, so they had to get at least a whale to pay for the trip. Uh, when the oil value began to drop because of kerosene and coal oil, they began to go after the walrus. And they must have killed 200,000 walrus, is an estimate, for the ivory. And then they began to sell alcohol because it was cheap for them to buy, and they sold it expensively, and it caused great harm to our people. There was a starvation that took place in St. Lawrence Island the winter of 1879, 1880, where most of the people died on that island because of starvation, because they were too drunk for too long. They had sold much of their gear. It was too late. There wasn't as many walrus, and they had starvation. So uh, there were at least 3,000 whaling voyages to Alaska between 1848 and 1885, okay? Now, they brought a lot, a lot of useful stuff, a lot of saws and hammers and axes and picks, but they also brought flu, measles, venereal disease, and famine. <clears throat> the Migratory Bird Treaty of uh, 1960, 1916, signed by the United States and Britain and others, essentially turned us into criminals because after a winter of rabbit and pike and ptarmigans, you know, it was nice to see those birds show up the ducks and the geese and the eiders and all these uh, millions of them. And the eggs were just awesome, but it was illegal for us to take them. So any, in any case, uh, the polar explorations, when Franklin got lost in that ill-fated trip, 
you know, it, it generated, I, ca I can't tell you how many uh, efforts to find him because his wife was rich. She had contacts and she pushed hard to try to find him. She even came to Sitka in 1869. Uh, but when, the, when a British ship came to Barrow in 1851, uh, a flu bug killed 40 people after they left. That's just one of the deals. There was a huge smallpox, smallpox epidemic, uh, 18, uh, 1835 to 1840. Started with a young Creole boy in the fort in Sitka. Before it was over, it had spread all the way to Norton Sound and wiping out probably a fourth to two-thirds of the population, leaving them the ones that survived blind or disabled. And so the mind and the spirit of the people were hit very hard with those epidemics. In any case, uh, it's not the whole story, um, but we have been through uh, quite a great deal in this part of the world that even our own people don't understand because it's not taught. It's just not taught very effectively in the schools. It's not taught, taught very effectively at all. We only have had, in, I tried to get a requirement for a high school uh, course in Alaska history back in the 80s when I was last in the Senate, but it, all I could get was a commission. You know, and fortunately, the uh, humanities formula has pushed it, so we have it now, but it's not being effectively done, I don't think. However, um, as speaking during the break, uh, what governments want is control. In the case of the Russians, they got it through taking hostages of children of the leaders. Uh, they required the payment of a tax called the yasak, which uh, the head of the household had to pay in fur or whatever. If he didn't pay it, he was jailed until his relatives paid it. Um, and uh, in Alaska, uh, the sad truth is that the missionary societies became a tool, an effective tool. They were the enforcement arm of the government uh, because of contracts uh, that Sheldon Jackson, who became head of education, federal education in Alaska, he was half employed by the federal government, half employed by the Board of Home Missions of the Presbyterian Church. So in America, we're supposed to have separation of church or state, right? Well, not up here. Essentially, Sheldon Jackson turned over our children to the missionaries. And they were the ones who began to eliminate, essentially, our languages, our ceremonies, our dance, our music, our art, our potlatches. So something was either sinful or illegal. And I think even to this very day, our own people don't quite understand the nature of that nexus between church and state that had such a powerful effect on our people and I think began to plant the seeds of negativity about our own identity and our own culture and our values, our spirituality. <clears throat> okay. Now, the last great battle was over land and there's nothing as emotional as land as you know from wherever you come from. Um, really, we were well on our way to losing it all. Uh, someone talked about the, the Constitutional Convention and the Constitutional Provisions on, uh, on municipalities. The reality is that we weren't there for whatever reason at the Constitutional Convention. We should have had 15 to 20 of our own people. There we had one. There were no issues relating to indigenous Alaska discussed that I'm aware of. The only person that tried to do something about land was Muktuk Marston, uh, who was the head of the uh, Alaska Territorial Guard during the war, he was sent out there to, to recruit uh, Alaska Natives to be a force against the Japanese. 
He went from village to village by dog team. He handed out rifles. He drilled the people. They loved him. They called him Muktuk for short. Uh, he tried to provide, he was a member of the constitutional delegation. He tried to get us 160 acres, but they basically treated him like a mushroom. You know what that is. Put him in a dark cave and throw something on him. <laughs> and nothing happened. Um, so all the issues that we deal with today, they were completely ignored. You know, our education issues, our subsistence issues, our land issues, not at all. So statehood was a, you know, an activity of the colonists and the pioneers. That's, all the way, that's the way it has been across the country. Take over the Indian lands, people move in, we form a state. Okay, that's what happened up here. Okay, um, the, um, I, I would have still, still been lost in the woods hadn't I had the great good fortune, as was mentioned earlier, of uh, by chance uh, taking a constitutional law course uh, from Judge Rabinowitz, who was our youngest uh, justice of the Supreme Court. <clears throat> and to this very day, I, I, I wonder why he was teaching. Uh, we had no law school. Uh, and I attribute it to maybe he was lonesome because there were probably no cases filtering up at that point. It was only seven years after statehood, and he probably needed something to do. But in any case, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, and you'll find that in life sometimes that happens, uh, where something unplanned, uh, so you meet somebody, they say something, and all of a sudden, instead of your life going this way, you go this way. Well, that happened to me with this. I, was, I tried to be a lawyer for one semester. And uh, he asked us to do a paper on any subject of a legal nature. And I, I had been reading something about, you know, statehood. Uh, I, have, I had no concept of uh, indigenous rights whatsoever. You know, I, um, uh, even after having graduated from George Washington, you know, and after having volunteering at the National Congress of American Indians, uh, I, I couldn't relate the Indian experience to ours. You know, it was different. And, uh, and, and we had nothing to go on. I mean, it's the government's role to make sure that we didn't understand anything about ourselves. You know? And so uh, Rabinowitz's course allowed me to go back and take a look at the, the earliest uh, activities in America re relating to the Indians, the treaties, and the constitutional provisions. And I looked at the various court cases that began to come out under Justice Marshall. <clears throat> I, I looked at the, uh, the Treaty of Session. <clears throat> Excuse me, I wanted to know, you know, what did the Russians think they had? What did the Americans think they were buying? And what about us? Right? And then I began to look at the Organic Act and uh, the Allotment Act of 1887 that was applied to Alaska. In 06, I, I looked at the Missions Act of 1900. The churches took care of themselves. They got the, a square mile wherever they were if they needed it for their mission or their orphanage or whatever, but they didn't do anything for us. You know, uh, they cut their teeth on the American Indians down south, you know, and when they came up here, they decided, oh, my God, we wasted a lot of energy down there because we had so many churches at these tribes that we were battling over their souls, so up here, we'll just carve out areas. You know, the Baptists can take this, you know, the Catholics can take this, or the con congregation can take this, or the Covenants can take that, or the, you know, so, so they wouldn't waste their energies at, uh, battling over our souls. In any case, um, <clears throat> I looked at the, uh, uh, the, um, well, the Indian Reorganization Act of uh, 1934, which is, the, uh, and it's the source of our tribes up here. And uh, I looked at the method of compensation through the Indian Claims Commission, and before that, the Court of Claims, and then I looked at statehood. I thought, what? Here was an authorization by Congress to select over 100 million acres of our land without compensation, although they had a disclaimer clause in there, but they never defined what our rights were. And so I think the assumption by the political leaders in Alaska was that we had no rights. But when I looked at the court cases, 
I, I, I read up on Aboriginal title, there's substance to Aboriginal title that is compensable if it's taken. You know, and, and, and I realize that if we let the state have the secretary sign the interim conveyances for their selections, we're never going to see that land again, ever. All we could hope for is a few cents an acre 50 or 100 years from now. So that's what turned me into an activist, because I realized that we were in jeopardy, and we had to do something. We had to stop it somehow. And of course, that back then, we, we didn't have a lawyer. I wasn't a lawyer, but I could see maybe something that other lawyers couldn't see. And that, and, but, 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 but we had to work for it. You know? And uh, in any case, um, to make a long story short, um, thank God for Richard Nixon. Do blow grass. <laughs> I am not a crook, Nixon. Anyway, well, you know, he came from Whittier, California, right? He's a Quaker. The Quakers came to my hometown in 1897 from Whittier, California to look for gold. And that's how we ended up with a big school there and a big mission. We're the only Quaker region in Alaska. And I thought that's quite a coincidence that uh, Richard Nixon, without him getting behind our Settlement Act, we would never have gotten it. And uh, there were two things that could have prevented us from getting in that act, <coughs> as I look back. Uh, and that is, if the state wasn't on board, our delegation would do nothing. If the natives were divided, It wouldn't go anywhere. And why natives had to be united, I'll never understand. <laughs> but we held it together in spite of ancient animosities. We had some groups that had huge populations some, and small land bases. We had small populations with huge land bases. And it was a very complicated situation. You know, it takes a lot of energy and effort to, f uh, to pass a little law in Congress, let alone something as complex as, as this one. But uh, without Richard Nixon getting behind it, uh, it would never have happened. And so um, it's been 43 years since the passage of the Selman Act. We've had uh, huge adjustments to make uh, to begin to think in commercial terms and profit terms, as well as private property, which is really not, was not part of our mentality, even as a, as a youth. Uh, We've had to adapt to foreign institutions before. Uh, the tribe was not something we asked for. That was something that was passed, you know, to have a one-size-fits-all government for the rest of the Indians. It was applied to Alaska two years afterwards. Uh, we had nothing to do with the creation of the cities and boroughs. That was a project of Vic Fisher and the Constitutional Convention. We had to get used to running those things. Um, same with the borough. But one of the things that we have used is a nonprofit corporation. We formed, when we made our claim in Kotzebue, I had to borrow $10 to send, to buy stamps to send the letters out to the 11 villages. That was what precipitated what became NANA. Um, and uh, if we had tried to wait on the BIA to help us, uh, it would never have happened. Uh, and so we formed a nonprofit because we needed an entity, you know, to represent the villages that could act. Uh, back then, we had no lawyers in the early, early days. Uh, we had no media. I mean, I had to type the letters on those old typewriters where you had to hit hard to make four copies. Uh, and. Uh, we had no radio or television, so communication was a real problem. But nevertheless, we, we managed to get uh, our claim made. Uh, and thanks to Stuart Udall, good Mormon, lots of Western history. Uh, he was the trustee for Native American lands, reserves, allotments, rancherias, reservations. But of course, nobody had defined what, our, what were our lands in Alaska. 
So in a way, that land freeze that started was, I think, just inertia initially because they didn't know what to do. But I think they sensed that if they let the state have the land, that they were maybe violating our rights, whatever rights we might have had. And so at the, at the very end, after Nixon won, and our hero, Udall, was going out the door, he, uh, the, uh, Wally Hickel, who was governor, they were attacking uh, Udall for not having a statutory basis for this land freeze. And they were making headway. But at the absolute 11th hour before he went out the door, he withdrew the entire state of Alaska under a little used law called the Taylor Grazing Act. And that froze it solid before he went out the door. And then who becomes the guardian of the chickens? The fox. Wally Hickel was selected. <laughs> the guy we had battling, been battling tooth and tongue, all of a sudden was going to be our guardian, right? Well, the long, uh, to make another long story short is that we actually got more out of the Republicans than we got out of the Democrats initially because the Democrats didn't know how to respond and um, we did put a little bit of a, uh, what do you call that restraining device uh, when people go nuts? Straight jacket. We put a little straight jacket on Uncle Wally on the freeze. It wasn't easy. But had Senator Jackson and his committee not agreed with us uh, on maintaining that land freeze and getting that commitment, we, we would not have gotten a settlement. Because the oil was found in 68, they needed the right away. If there was no crisis, I doubt if we'd have gotten our settlement. But nonetheless, uh, what I'd like to say is that uh, when, when it comes to uh, change, in, in foreign institutions, um, it's been very difficult. Um, but uh, I remember my friend Oliver Levitt, Avirana, I call him, he, that's his Inupair name, from Barrow, who was chairman of ASRC and chairman of the borough in the past. Uh, he told me about the problems they had in trying to adjust uh, because under their early corporate, corporate uh, leadership, they were the real leaders, the whale hunters, the captains. And in, in, the, in, in, in that world, the younger men were to support them, to help them, um, to uh, listen, and not attempt to take control you know, and, but the younger generation, the young men and women knew that th it was a different world and they had to figure out a way uh, to make it work. I remember looking at a video where Eddie Hobson, who was I think their first president, he was using uh, the traditional language and he had a uh, handwritten um, Oh, um, oh, description of what the role of a board of directors is and the role of the shareholders. And he was conferring, uh, conveying all that in Inupiaq. That was how fundamental the beginning of the corporation effort was. And so they actually had to spend days on end holed up in a hotel trying to work out this leadership issue so that the younger generation could give the benefit of their understanding and, and their education that they had received. And they must have been successful because Arctic Slope, of course, is a, a very, very successful, very large, multi-billion dollar corporation now. Okay. Um, I guess, uh, well, what about the opportunities in the Arctic? Um, many of the Alaska Native corporations now operate on a world scale. We started out early on in the 70s by just setting up the corporation, frantically trying to get the land because there's a deadline uh, selected. Um, we had to try to figure out what, uh, what investments to make. And, um, and then we sort of expanded to Prudhoe Bay because that's where all the action was. That's where money was being spent by ARCO and BP. 
you know. And then, uh, and then because of 8A, the small business program, you know, villages and regions got exposed to U.S. out-of-state business activity, and then, and then global, in some cases. And so, uh, th I believe that uh, there is expertise out there, uh, but the question is, will they have the opportunity? And uh, they are engaged in almost every conceivable field, from construction to engineering to logistic, communications, insurance, security, food service, mining, timber, fisheries, drilling, remote camp maintenance, and a host of other services. Uh, this is what we've been able to do you know, with this rather meager settlement. I mean, some people think it's, it, it, it was ma it's massive in terms of what kind of settlements Native Americans have received in terms of land and money, but the reality is that when you think of how much has been taken from one small piece of former Native lands, Prudhoe Bay, billions to the state, you know, billions to the oil companies, billions to the federal government, billions to the contractors, you know, it, 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 is a pit, it is a pittance. And I had, we had hoped that we could have gotten the 2% the overriding royalty in perpetuity. We were going to lose our lands in perpetuity. Uh, but we, you know, <laughs> once the system gets into the caucus room, you know, you're outside the door, and they're inside the door, so you do the best you can. But in any case, uh, with countries like China and Korea and Singapore and England and others uh, desperate for resources um, with capital to spend, it, it makes us wonder whether or not we will have the opportunity to participate if anything transpires of any consequence uh, in the Arctic as a consequence of the warming. Um, but the, the ICC, the Inuit Circumpolar Council, which I helped form back in 77 up in Barrow, I think it's done a remarkable job of trying to keep our concerns before the eight Arctic nations, you know. And uh, both the North Slope Borough and the Northwest Arctic Borough, you know, have been active. In, in fact, uh, Reggie Jewell, who was in the legislature, now mayor of the Northwest Arctic Borough, you know, did a great deal to try to keep Alaska uh, active through the uh, Northern Waters Task Force. Uh, which eventually, you know, formed, formed the commission that uh, we have now. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, our own country, uh, working through the Arctic Council, you know, will continue to uh, keep open communications with people who live in the Arctic, and that in some way we might be able to partic participate uh, uh, in what transpires uh, if there are marine resources out there, hopefully our people have a chance to, to harvest them. And uh, the good news is that we came under the wing of the United States. If that had not happened, we would have been in deep, deep anak. <laughs> you can translate that. Um, and uh, or. Perhaps the best alternative would have been if we had had some real leaders on the non-native side, we could have formed our own country. We could have had a wonderful land with tremendous resources, and we could have controlled immigration. Thank you very much. <laughs>